Hey everybody, welcome to the Mirko Movie Guys. I'm Clint Schaffer and this is my buddy Chad Weeks. And we're a couple guys who like movies and like to talk about movies. And we have a real special treat for you, and more so for us, because I'm real excited. We've got uh, John Wesley Norton, who is the uh, an award-winning director, writer, and producer. And we're going to talk to him about uh, some things around that he's uh, in his business, as well as his new movie, For Hannah, that uh, just came out on Amazon. So, I mean, we've been doing this for, what, a little over a year? Just barely over a year, yeah. And we are now interviewing a real director. <laughs> I know. This is a big moment. Well, I'm, I'm really excited about this. I'm excited, too. So uh, grab your popcorn. Fill up your drinks. And enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Mirko Movie Guys. So today we have an exciting show and we're going to be talking with award-winning director John Wesley Norton. Yeah, award-winning director, producer, writer. Sounds like John does a little bit of everything here. So uh, I guess, I, it, John, first off, um, I'd like for you to introduce your movie. We, we, Clint and I watched it the other night uh, for Hannah. I loved it. <laughs> I like it a lot and I'd like to talk, to it, talk about it a lot. But can you give a little bit of an introduction about what the movie's about and, 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 and go from there? Sure, sure. I appreciate that. First, I just uh, I'm happy to be here with you guys. Um, both of you, uh, Chad and Clint. I mean, I think uh, you guys have an awesome podcast. You know, I, I sounds like you guys have a great time talking about movies. I, I teach film at the Illinois Media School and we talk about movies nonstop. So I think we're all on the same page. Yeah. With that. Um, all about talking about movies. <laughs> Yeah, For Hannah was a project that was brought to me by 2-9 Productions, uh, Suzette Brown and Shannon Brown, and developed a story that they thought we could do during these times of COVID. So uh, it was designed specifically to be a very, very small cast and a very, very small crew that we could sequester for a couple weeks. And uh, in the dead of winter, uh, the coldest film that I've ever been a part of, I believe, and so it was designed for the, the situation that we find ourselves in right now. And it turned out really well. Uh, when I, they brought me the story that had the basic story elements, the characters, the basic premise. Um, I wrote the script over the course of maybe four weeks. And, uh, and then we started shooting not too long after that. Um, everything about it was designed to be uh, smooth to produce because some films take a year to, to get up and running, right? This one, we wanted to get it done in the winter. So we didn't have a lot of lead time. And it went, uh, everything went by the numbers. It was one of the smoothest um, productions that I've been a part of. And I think that's primarily because 2-9 Productions is just so on top of everything, producing, producing wise. Yeah, and I got I got a few questions off of that. First, uh, first off, Shannon Brown, he's he's Chance in the movie, correct? The the drifter type of guy here who's you know a ma main character one of the three main characters here correct 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 uh second you said you said that uh it took four weeks to, to write the script how how long does this how long does a film like this take to make from the time you start to to, to finish well i want to say that it was probably written in october and i think we started shooting in late january okay and, and where are you shooting because this was shot in Galena, Illinois. Oh, okay. yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a local. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's um, well, Elizabeth, Illinois. So, okay. but uh, we did uh, utilize a friend of mine's home out there. He lives out in the woods, so I wrote it for that house. There was the diner. I wrote it for that diner. And when you're an independent filmmaker, it often behooves you to use elements that you already have access to, and it makes the writing process so much easier trying to find locations is a pain in the butt absolutely i can i so, can totally agree with that so so you had, you had writing credits in this as well so i mean when you're talking about this story kind of you know came to you i mean how did this even get its start from a from a screen you know a, the, the script all the way to you know actually making this movie right. so shannon brown and suzette brown have story credits so they did an outline, they had the basic premise, and they brought it to me and asked if this is something I would be interested in doing. And I'm always interested in working with, uh, with that company. I've, I've been the director of photography on several of their past productions, which I love to do. I love being director of photography on other people's films. <laughs> it, 
take such a pressure off of the, the pre-production, which I find just a pain. Pre-production is it's it's the most difficult part of it in in my estimation. But the uh, I wrote the screenplay kind of based around the story that they brought to me. Of course, I um, I tweaked it a little bit because I had to stretch it out to a certain amount of time. But the basic premise, the elevator pitch, was there at the okay. beginning. So I just had to expand it out into the uh, the feature length, and it went pretty smoothly actually because we I knew what actors I was writing for, which also helps. Yeah. I know what uh, characters I would like to see them play. So the pre-production was very smooth. I'll just say that. It was, it was a joy. Other than COVID. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so when you have, when you're writing, uh, you know, you know the cast in mind. One of those cast members outlined, you know, helped outline this entire story. Does that make it easier or more difficult when you're actually casting that person as a character? Well... I, I it, the film actually is exactly the way I thought it would be when I was writing it. Um, we were that precise with the, the pre-production, so there was there was no I don't know if this this person is right for the role. There was there was none of that stuff. Um, it, and they gave me they didn't really look over my shoulder while I was writing the screenplay either. I mean they tried me pretty much entirely to develop the story based on their. Uh, their pitch. So, so to build off that a little bit, uh, you, you said, first off, I'd like for you to explain how the pre-production is and production goes, uh, just a, you know, a rough, a 500 mile overview of that too. But also, um, I think that one of the strongest points of this, this film was all the, the character interactions, which I, I'm a guy that I love character interactions. Um, no country for old men is one of my favorite films because of the, the character interactions in there. And I get a lot of that from the, the sheriff, uh, see a lot of Tommy Lee Jones, honestly, from, from no country for old men in that type of character there where he's kind of, you know, got kind of some old stories and that sort of thing that he works in there. The diner, uh, the waitress at the diner. I love the fact that when she was asked about the, uh, uh, I can't remember what she was at. Oh, about the, about the, the person she saw in the diner. Oh. And next thing you know, she goes into, uh, a, a child that she's, that she's well, working with at, at her school and stuff like that. And that story that just keeps going. And it's, I love those type of interactions. Was that something you came up with or was that something that chance or no, not chance Shannon brought in or how does, how does that come about? Pretty much wrote all the dialogue. Um, like I said, they, they developed the basic premise, which was the, I guess, like I said, the elevator pitch man robs a bank, his car breaks down. He goes to a house in the middle of the woods and the, Set in 1987, which is important. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but we did not realize how difficult that was going to be. Okay. Uh, if it would have been set last week, we would have had no problems. Set in 1987 presented a lot of challenges. Yeah. We say, particularly finding vehicles. <laughs> That's what I figured. <laughs> that, what was it? Was it a Cadillac or a Lincoln? A Lincoln that that uh, that they drove in there. <laughs> to a few things but we did not realize that in that era the 80s no one saves those cars there's mm -hmm. just classic about cars in the 80s so we had to get things from like the 70s so like people like the trucks and whatnot that people actually do keep you know but we did not realize how difficult it was going to be to find uh certain things like the television we had a heck of a time finding the television <laughs> <laughs> you know, you should have you should have called me because I might bet my grandparents have one in their garage right now that, <laughs> that they're still hanging on to in case they need to use it for some reason. <laughs> I mean, so that as far as producing goes, you asked about producing. Um, Suzette Brown was the line producer on on this film from Two Nine Productions, and she is a dynamo. She's just very very good at that. It took a lot of pressure off of me, which allowed me to just worry about how I was going to shoot it because I was the DP as well. So how am I going to cover it? So I was able to just focus on that and all of the logistical things pretty much was taken care of by, uh, by Shannon and Suzette's company. So that's, it was a joy to do other than it was so cold. Oh, it looked like it. <laughs> it looked miserable. <laughs> we were supposed to, I had a little bit of a reprieve because we were supposed to shoot at it, shoot, I want to say at the very beginning of January, but I came down with COVID. So that pushed us off almost a month. And I used that month. Yeah. Right? Really 
tone the way I was going to shoot it. So when by the time we got to set, we managed to shoot the entire film in 11 days, which is extremely fast. Oh, wow. 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 It's incredible. I say that's incredibly fast. But but also it's a small cast, so I'm sure that it was more of you guys knew what you wanted from each other and that sort of thing. So is I mean most, you guys worked together quite a bit before, so I'd assume that's the case. Yeah, it was it was not overly difficult to shoot, but the everything shot outside was a, a real challenge because it was the coldest week of the year. Yeah. And rarely got it was hovering at zero the entire time. Wow. I've been there- in cold but this was this was like i don't know if i want to do this anymore yeah Yeah. well well, that even presents you know i mean not only you know everybody there in the crew and cast is cold but also i mean that that actually causes some equipment some some equipment challenges i mean batteries don't last as long you gotta you know i mean things just not functioning as well yeah I've, i've been on shoots where lenses will fog up if you try to take them from a cold environment back into a warm environment so we were very cognizant of that. We never took equipment straight into a yep. warm. We had to warm it up first and then take it into the, the house. Um, so, so you talked about, you know, taking that month, you know, to really kind of get your mind around how you're going to shoot that. Uh, does it help being the beans that you wrote the, the actual script? Does that help you in that process? Kind of expedite that a little bit? Because, I mean, are you kind of thinking that through even during the writing process? Well, when, I, when I'm writing something for myself to, to make, I write with budget in mind and coverage in mind, generally. Um, when I'm writing something, I write screenplays. I have a manager in LA too. So when I write screenplays that are to spec out, not for me to make, but for like a larger budget film, then I don't care about any of that, right? That's not my job to care about that. But when I'm going to make it, yeah, I'm very co- cognizant of how much is this going to cost oh. each scene. How much is this going to cost to shoot? Yeah, and uh, I don't know what the final budget was on this film, but it's very low budget. Very low budget. I'm shocked that we were able to pull it off, to be honest. But we had a great team. Again, the producing team—they've uh, done plenty of other films, and they're just really great at. Uh, everyone is really great at stretching a buck all the people involved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you mentioned it a little bit, but your, your, some of your scenes, uh, the cinematography and that sort of thing. Uh, some of that was really cool. Uh, I, I love the I love the cut scenes when you're going from like when, when chance is outside and he's getting frustrated and he starts to scream and cuss and it cuts straight to the TV. I love, I love those type of scenes like that. I love that, that transition. Uh, yeah. You know, we're just like a, a loud noise, but he doesn't, you don't actually hear the big F word or whatever it was he's about to say. It just cuts right to that. Um, some of the stuff, uh, well, you know, I would add on to like, you know, I mean, even the, uh, I liked the, the glow and the hue of the, all the Christmas lights, right. Yeah. Cause that whole house is, is lit up and, and that played very well into some of those scenes. Like, uh, I mean, just as it cuts and you have the glow behind and yeah. anyway. well, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, Frank looking up at the, at chances coon light or whatever, whatever you want to call it, it spotlight headlight. We call it a coon light around here, but anyway, it, uh, where he's looking up from the ground at that—that's the only light there. I think that's a cool scene. I really like that. So, so was that you figuring out those angles there then, or is that do you have a somebody specifically yeah, forced? Go yeah, ahead. you can so much uh, ahead of time uh, when you're low budget. Uh, when so a lot of that stuff has to be blocked on set, and then you kind of figure out the best way to cover it, right? Um, and you use what you have. The Christmas lights from the very beginning, I was determined to get as many Christmas lights in that house. As yeah. I didn't want it to be a Christmas movie. So now I can say I've made a Christmas movie. Um, but it's, I mean, I, I had learned on a previous film to wrap Christmas lights around the lens and around the camera. Therefore, it gives you glow forward. Oh, yeah. Ah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Absolutely. I could, yeah. Then a lot of the lighting was just a gigantic ball of Christmas lights taped to a, a light stand. Oh, uh, that's cool. I can get it really close to people's faces and all the different colored lights give them a lot of dappling effect on their on their skin. So yeah, I guess as an independent, you always have to try to figure out solutions to problems. And this film was a lot of fun to to shoot because of the environment that we created. 
So, so another thing, you know, it's funny, uh, my, my, my wife and I, uh, rented it last night and, uh, on, uh, on Amazon, we, uh, we, we watched, uh, watch that movie. And, uh, and the interesting part, one of the first things that my wife said was, I love the music in this, like the, the music was incredibly intense, uh, and just very fitting in, in all the different scenes. Is that, is that your input? Is that kicking over to, uh, to a sound person that's, that's adding those things? How does that get mixed in? DC McAuliffe is my composer. Um, he's probably he's probably written music for uh, half a dozen films of, of mine, right? And uh, I really like his style a lot. All I really have to do is find a piece of music that kind of ha- gives me an idea. And for this one, believe it or not, it was the soundtrack of First Blood. <laughs> really. <laughs> There was a few, there's few, there's a, there's cues in that, that I gave DC. I said, listen to the, listen to the score for first blood. Just listen to it. And he did. And uh, he did his own thing with it, of course. But that was really the only note that I gave him other than once he scored it, I had to adjust the lengths of scenes and he would have to go in and finesse it and make it fit. But I've worked with him so long that I, I've just, I trust his instincts as a composer. And I think he nailed it on this film. I, I think it it was so fitting for the year 1987, right? Because I actually think that played into where it was very much the feel of an 80s thriller, yeah. right? Like that kind yeah. of intense music that you would hear on Halloween or yeah. something of that nature, you, right? You knew something was coming yeah. from the moment it started. <laughs> like, was, I, think the, I think the music actually started, because I watched it with subtitles, and like the first line said, like, ominous music starts playing. I'm like, whoa, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but but you're saying, you're saying that, uh, that the first blood was the was kind of an influencer for the score of this movie was there were there any other influences on it that, that i tell you what this is the film that i firmly had in mind when i was writing it okay and it was a simple plan so sam raimi's a simple plan was the movie i had in mind oh. a little bit of fargo a little oh. those are the two fargo. that those feel cold to me those movies feel cold and <laughs> Huge fan of anything Sam Raimi does, of course. My, Absolutely. My company is Boomstick Entertainment. After uh, this is my Boomstick from yeah. Um. So yeah, uh, Army of Darkness. But oh. uh, yeah, I had to. I had to write so fast that I really had to kind of have a couple films in mind for uh, how to, I guess, not pace it, but how to block it out on the the page and the story um it's not it's not like it's some original story it's firmly rooted in that genre right so it's kind of fun when you limit yourself and then you have to be creative with it i mean i think there is a lot of interesting ideas in the film but i wanted it to be that kind of film right so it it does feel like it's from the 80s because we all had that in our mind when we were shooting it you know, there's no digital effects. Uh, the coverage is very traditional, you know, as far as the way it's shot. There's no what I call fireworks camera work, like a modern day, you know. So it's all kind of as if the camera works based on films that were shot in the 80s. Um, well, it, it's funny. You, you talked about the ominous music. So one of the first things I did before I watched the, the, the movie in its entirety is I like to watch your trailer. Right. So, you know, I hit, I, you know, hit watch trailer. And the funny thing is it shows that opening scene with a squirrel going to the, going to the corn. Right. Yet like jingle bells is playing or something, right. Very Christmassy theme. So when the movie started and all of a sudden you have a little bit of that ominous music, I'm like, this is setting a little different tone right at the beginning. I was expecting like Christmas music at the beginning. I, trailer, so I don't, I don't know that scene. Like oh that. yeah. Yeah. It starts out. It's, it's all Christmas music. Yeah. So I'm mm. a little ashamed that I didn't make the connection with the, with the Sam Raimi and uh, the Boomstick, and honestly, like that's a great comparison with this with some of his his films as well. Like you could totally see that if you were yeah. It's funny about the squirrel. The, that shot lasts about five seconds. It took me forty minutes to shoot it. Yeah. <laughs> Wait out there. Well, actually, I just put the camera out there and just went inside and watched out the window until that squirrel came and got that corn. Uh, so, but I was pretty proud of it. I thought it looks great. Yeah, no, that's a great way to start out. So that's no, that's wonderful. What what was one of the 
the outside of the weather and maybe the time crunch that you're in, what, what else would be your, your biggest, uh, the, the biggest pain that, that you had, you know, trying to, trying to get this movie. So as far as production goes, it is, um, single location movies are always tough. They're tough primarily in the scripting because it's hard to draw out drama in one location uh, because you run the risk of being boring, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what can we do here? So I guess the challenge was making the story have enough twists and turns and and upping the ante to where that didn't happen. So writing for a single location is is a challenge. But I love single location movies I, because I appreciate the challenge of the filmmakers oh. to get those films done. So I, I think that was a challenge to use the environment, to use the house in such a way that we weren't repeating ourselves all the time. Yep. Who had that basement, by the way? Because that basement was basically a dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> like, <ooh. laughs> the cellar is the one location that is not in Galena. That's actually my house. Okay. All right. <laughs> Yeah, the cellar. That's what he called it, the cellar. I wrote it for that house, right? So I know ahead of time before I'm Oh, there, yeah. Right? Where they're dragging the body across the snowfield, that's across the street from my house, right? So I knew okay. exactly how I was writing it, exactly how it was going to look. And that shot looks exactly the way I pictured it, so I'm very happy about that. That 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 was a that was a great sh- I like that whole that whole scene. I thought that was a yeah. that was a great scene. Yeah, one of my one of my favorite scenes was the uh the scene where well, talking about the actresses here, too. Carla uh, Abruzzo was the leading lady here. Um, I think she kind of stole the show, and 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 it. Um, she did a lot of. I think she did a lot of acting with her eyes. I feel like there was a lot of a uh, lot of things that weren't necessarily said or done, but she did a lot of acting with her eyes, and I really really appreciated that. Uh, the scene where she was looking in the mirror and wiping off her makeup, uh, getting so frustrated, wiping off her makeup to to basically like she was sick of looking good for Frank, and then she puts her makeup back on to look good for chance. And I think that's, I, I think that's a, my wife thought, thought that that was a really cool uh, okay. transition into her personality, where she was going as a character. Uh, it, I, I really loved that scene. I am happy that you uh, recognize that because that's exactly <laughs> what I'm going for. it. I never worked with Carla before. This is the first time I've worked with everybody else, but Carla was, was new. And I just met her on set. I really hadn't, I had a conversation with her on, uh, I think on the phone, I think it was, she was actually cast before I even came on board. I think they wanted Carla to be in the film. So I wrote the I wrote the the movie kind of with her in mind without even really knowing who she was. But I knew she was a good actor because I'd seen her reel and she does some really great stuff in her reel. But she definitely she's always in the scene. So uh, she's even when she's not talking, she is very present in the scene and uh, and you're right about her eyes. She's really, really good at that. And I'm, I'm, we're going to work together again because she, she was dynamite to work with. Absolutely. absolutely. My, my favorite scene with her, I love the makeup scene, yeah. but my favorite scene that uh, was was towards the uh, towards the beginning when uh, when she has the breakdown at the kitchen table, and it's like she goes to have a breakdown, she pulls herself back together, and then she. She goes to have a breakdown. She pulls herself back together, and it's like that that fight, right? That that battle within herself. Uh, I just thought was I, I thought that set the stage of like just where where we were going to see that character kind of launch into. Well, it's funny because Shannon is uh, he. I really like working with Shannon. He's a great actor, but he in our, my conversation with him, uh, he knew that this was Emma's story. It is her story. So he was always talking to me, just make sure that Emma is the one who is up front and that's the audience's character. And she, and we, and we did that, what you're saying about how she changed, that was even present in wardrobe. We, we changed her wardrobe all throughout the film to make her looser. She was very formal, almost like a 50s housewife at the beginning. Yeah. At the end, she's, she's a changed person by the end. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, some of the other actors and actresses there, uh, 
Frank, Frank was easily hateable. You know, like he was a guy that like he did his job perfectly because you just you instantly hated him and couldn't stand the guy. So he did his job great. The, the, the funny thing is with Frank, it, it was I don't know if I was if I was frustrated at Frank or frustrated for with chance for not just hitting Frank right at the very beginning. It's like it's like you just you just wanted the guy to stop talking yeah. at one point in time. But he's a he's a used car salesman. Does what was that written? Like, is that what would the whole well, thought was? Kind of a, a used car salesman. That was well. I mean, that's you know. But I mean, is that like the personality that you were trying to develop with him? Used car salesman in in every sense of the word. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The used car thing is part of the elevator pitch. So that was the original idea that was given to me. So I did work with that. And the thing I appreciate by, appreciate about Rick is, yeah, he is the the bad guy he's the foil but he doesn't play it like super villainy you know he's almost like pretty laid back through most yeah. of the thing and he's just always thinking about you know uh what he needs to do to to do what he needs to do in the film so he didn't overplay it so that's no, kind of and it kept you guessing the the entire time you never knew what was what his uh, what his final plan was, you, yeah, you, you really, I, I, at least I didn't. I, I never could really kind of guess what route, you know, you could have a kind of have a little loose feel, but yeah. you never, it never put me on the, the right path, you know, yeah. like. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I, I, and when you say the cast, I, I'm, I'm really uh, lucky to have the cast that we did uh, working with Bruce Spielbauer, who I've worked with many, many times in the past. But I wrote this, I knew he was going to nail the sheriff. I knew it. So uh, I, I said, what do you think about this sheriff character? And he says, Sam Elliott. I say, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to, you know, I was going to say that, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to, to stereotype here because of the mustache and the, the hat and stuff like that. But that's exactly who I wanted to mention was Sam Elliott, but I didn't uh, want to be a, a more comedic Sam Elliott. Yeah, though. Exactly. Like, cause, cause he brought a little comedy, like when his, his comment of, eight days yeah. <laughs> like that. I, I literally started laughing out loud because I just I loved the way that he acted that right there. Yeah. Where it's just like eight days. That's all I had. <laughs> uh, it's always fun to work with that group of actors, you know, and I've worked with, you know, whenever you whenever you work in film a lot, like like I do, you do develop kind of a cadre of people that you enjoy working with. And it be when you know you're going to use them again, it becomes easier in the scripting process because you know what their strengths are. And that's kind of what this was. I, did, I wrote all these parts for these people knowing that their strengths would lead to, you know, solid performances. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I can't say enough good things about uh, the project. It was just a, a joy to work on and we're really happy with the way it turned out. And, um, yeah, we're just we're just pleased with it. So, uh, I, I, well, I guess, uh, are, are we I think gonna... that's, yeah, I got some other stuff, but I can wait until after you do your, your, your either or questions. Here. Yeah. I just had a, I had a couple, uh, a couple off topic or off the, off the movie that I just wanted to shoot you a few, uh, a few questions, few personal questions here. So we're going to start right off the bat here and go Star Trek, Star Wars. Man, that is tough. Uh, I would have said Star Trek years ago. Now I don't know if I want to say either, to be honest. Because <laughs> <laughs> I love science fiction. Star Wars is fantasy, not really science fiction, right? So I, I'm going to say that my ultimate favorite is the first, like, five, six Star Trek movies. That's where I'm at. Yep. Um, Star Wars is great. There's no, there's no problem with Star Wars either, but I just, I'm kind of a Trek guy from way back. All right. We All just right. we just had that coming to, to Jesus moment uh, on one of our last podcasts here. Uh, we were doing it over Dune, but uh, I'm more of a Star Trek guy. And I think I just need to accept that. I, I like Star Trek more than I do Star Wars. So yeah, that. yeah, <laughs> definitely on the Star Wars side. But, <laughs> yeah. you know. All right. So next one uh, on that same same kind of topic here. But uh, Marvel or DC? Well, I'm going to have to. I've been a Marvel guy my entire life. I mean, I mean, I've been reading the comic books since I was from like the late 70s you know and i'm so happy with what marvel's done with the mcu i've been waiting for it my entire life okay on my entire life so amen movies even if the movie's not good i'm gonna love it it doesn't matter 
<laughs> you know, so I, I love what Kevin Feige has done with the, it's what he's done with the MCU is unparalleled, unparalleled. So Absolutely. yeah, I mean, so I, um, I'm not to say I don't like DC. Uh, I'm, I, I do. I just don't know as much about it as I do Marvel. You know, it, it's funny that you say this unparalleled because it's, it's what Chad and I have discussed. We'll probably discuss it when we talk about spider-man in our in our next uh next episode which uh the, the the funny thing is i'm never shocked at how far out marvel can can be thinking i mean you can watch a movie the first avenger and all of a sudden they will make some tie some random obscure tie 10 movies down the line and it ties back to it somewhere and it just it just amazes it's me. it's really a what a time to be alive because like the payback payoff that you know like i said w- when you're a kid watching all this stuff and I'm a Spider-Man guy, I've always been a Spider-Man guy. Now you've got Spider-Man on the big screen all the time. And he's just, he's absolutely killing it. They're doing it so much justice. It's fantastic. What a time to be alive. Yeah. All right. Next one off of movies a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we always like to, uh, to drink our, uh, our scotch on this show. So I got to ask scotch or bourbon. Well, I, I gotta be honest. I did not start drinking until I was 39, so, which is weird. Right. So, I don't have the the acquired taste for certain hard liquors. Nope. My drink is port wine. So oh, I'm yeah. a port wine person, right? And so I'm I'm that's where I'm at, kind of that. Now if I if I want to get hammered, it would be bur- bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great answer though. I love that. And I don't I don't drink socially. Uh I when I drink it's I'm on a mission, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I get that. Uh, all right. So I got a couple more, a uh, couple more just personal questions here. Uh, first, uh, or the next one is going to be, what is the first movie that you saw in a movie theater? The first movie I saw in a theater was the time, the land that time forgot. The land that time forgot that man. I think I remember that one. That was, uh, that had like the, 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 it was a dinosaur movie, right? Basically goes into the crack in the ice and comes up in the dinosaur world yeah okay yeah i i vaguely remember that one it's been a long time but that's a that's an awesome call out but it was a great first movie in the theater yeah oh yeah i think it sparked my interest in movies having that be my first experience uh and it's quite quite a film i will say it's probably dated now but at the time it was quite a film yeah and then my last one would just be, what is your most influential movie that you would just have to put at the top of your list? <laughs> influential? Well, my favorite movie is going to probably be The Thing. Okay? John Carpenter's The Thing. Yep. Because I never get tired of it. You know, I mean, for a long time, I would say maybe Raiders of the Lost Ark because it's so awesome. I can't watch Raiders of the Lost Ark over and over and over. But if if I have nothing else to watch, I can watch the thing and be and completely be enthralled again and not get tired of it. And the same kind of like maybe with uh, Creep Show. I've watched Creep Show. I've probably seen Creep Show fifty times, and to this day, there's something about it because you know some films you just don't get tired of it. And from I think those two are the ones I've seen the most. The thing and Creep Show, I've seen those movies the, the most. That's those are awesome answers. I love the I love the thing. That's a great one. So, you know, uh, I, I just seen the other day. You just mentioned Raiders of the Lost Ark, and uh, and they zoomed in when he was uh, there were some hieroglyphics behind him, and they zoom in, and there's three CPO and R two D two in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've never seen it before. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, that was going to be my, one of my questions, which is just what's uh, a movie that you would recommend anybody watch, uh, still same answer. Would it be the thing that, you know, if you had to say, it, uh, as a movie fan, you should watch this movie. People of my era, everybody, every filmmaker in my general age group loves John Carpenter. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I just, it's, for, it's just some. it's just, we were at that age when he had all those hits one after the other and they're, they're, they're classics. Yeah. So. I mean, to me, John Carpenter can do no wrong with the exception of maybe Memoirs of an Invisible Man. But uh, other than that, everything else, top notch. Uh, he is my he is my most influential director. I'll just say that. Oh, yeah, that's great. I love it. 
So uh, last question that I got for you here, John, we'll let you go. Uh, you said you've got to be on, um, you've got to be on, on set tonight. What, what's next for you? What's the next, uh, what's next come down the line? What do you, uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, of course. Uh, the film, there's a, I'm doing a form. I just, we shot for Hannah. Then I was a director of photography on a faith-based movie called Honest to God. And I think that's coming out in February. And now I'm director of photography on Torture of the Flesh. So I went right from honest to God to torture the flesh. <laughs> <laughs> Out there as this title seems. I mean, it is a crazy kind of gore fest. So I've never really shot that kind of stuff before. So I'm, I'm learning as I go, but we had a great makeup artist and a uh, practical effects guy. And he's doing some, some great work. And uh, I'm, I'm learning a lot on that film. So yeah, we'll be shooting that tonight. I think there's only four shoot days left after that. And then I'm shooting a comedy in February and supposed to be shooting a horror movie in the spring and then an action movie in the late summer. Oh, wow. wow. Man, you are you are busy. <laughs> but that's my uh, schedule as far out as I can see. <laughs> so, yeah, that's nice. That's a, that's a, that's a good problem to have, so yeah. I like it. All right, uh, another 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 thing. Uh, I got one more. I gotta ask uh, just just while while John's here, which is one piece of advice. If somebody's watching this and they're thinking about getting into directing, producing, writing, acting, whatever they're trying to break into, what is one piece of advice that you would just have to tell somebody? Well, if you're going to be a screenwriter as well. I mean, the easiest thing for you to do is develop the project with the budget in mind, like I said before, because the days of like crowdfunding and that kind of stuff, that stuff's pretty much dried up. Uh, it's really difficult to do that. So I think a good pre-production is the key. Uh, make sure everything's sorted out. So when you get on set, you don't look like you don't know what you're doing because then you lose the confidence of, Pretty much everybody. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The director has to know what they what they want because if they don't know what they want, they can't tell you, you know, what to do. So it's, oh. um, I guess it's preparation. Say that preparation. That's what I would say. Perfect. No, well, I appreciate that. So appreciate that advice, and also, uh, I mean, we appreciate you coming on uh, onto our our little podcast here, John, and uh, and having a having a conversation with us. Yeah, this has well, been great. Come back because this is great. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Yeah, too. <laughs> yeah, well, let us know what the you know when the when the next movie drops. Let us know. We'll watch it. We'll bring you back on. Let's have so let's keep this conversation going. Great, I really appreciate it, guys. Yeah. All right, well, hey, good luck to you in uh, in your next project here. Uh, have fun waking up at, at you know like two o'clock this in the <laughs> yeah. morning here. I, know, I better get I better get at it. I'm, I'm <laughs> All right, take care. Thanks, thank John. you. Well, that wraps up our interview with John Wesley Norton. And Chad, that was absolutely a pleasure. He really was. He's such a cool guy. Like, uh, I don't know. I just really felt like it was just a really nice conversation. And, and it was a, I enjoyed the heck out of it. Well, it's, it, it was really cool talking to somebody that just knows the ins and outs of – he knows all the things about what happens to actually make a movie. And I thought that was just absolutely cool. Yep. And, and John said uh, before the, we actually started off the interview, he's talking about uh, the, the fact that he just, he talks about movies a lot and that's, that's what we do here. And that's exactly what it was. Just uh, three guys talking about movies yeah. and it was awesome to get his input on it. I, I couldn't be happier with the show today. Yeah, and and so again, John, thank you for coming on. Uh, that was awesome. Can't wait to have you back. Uh, can't wait to see your next uh, next project either. So uh, make sure everybody checks out for Hannah on Amazon. Go yeah, on, check it out. Yeah, it was great. Loved yep. it. So hey, with that, we loved that interview, and we ask that if you like it, be sure to like the video, subscribe, and also ring the bell to get notified each and every time that Chad and I push out new content. Uh, also, uh, we are going to be pushing out our next episode. We're going to be talking about Spider-Man No Way Home, right? Yeah, No Way Home. I almost Finally. said Far From Home. Finally, but no, yeah, that was, yeah. No, that was the other one. That was the one. Yeah. yeah. So, so be sure to tune in on that. That's going to be our next episode. Really excited to talk about Spider-Man as well. Uh, and so with that, the credits are rolling. The lights are coming off. That's the end of the show.